hand up, Sandra Gwynn. Thank you, Mr. Evans, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship, and I congratulate my honourable friend, the member for Weaver Vale, for securing what is an absolutely crucial and important debate today, uh, and for the uh, many Labour members who have contributed uh, to this debate, and in particular uh, those that gave speeches, my honourable friends for Peterborough, for Hull West and Hesel, for Liverpool Walton, for North West Durham and uh, for Lee, because uh, they speak up on behalf of their communities that are really struggling in the face of eight years of Tory austerity. Yeah. Now, Mr Evans, I find it bitterly surprising uh, that there isn't a single member of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, save for the Minister and her PPS, uh, because I can't believe that after eight years of cuts, after eight years of the destruction and decimation of our public services, that there isn't a single member of the Conservative Party that is willing to stand up for their communities and to say to this minister and the government, enough is enough. I will give way. Emma Hardy. On that point exactly, I've already spoken about the cuts that are facing East Riding of Yorkshire Council. Now my constituency represents a very small part of East Riding of Yorkshire Council, but it appears that the Conservative members of Parliament that represent the East Riding of Yorkshire Council, the member for Beverly and Holderness, don't appear to be here. So why is it left to some of the Labour MPs to actually give the message to the government about what's happening in their own Conservative controlled councils? I agree wholeheartedly with my honourable friend, and, and, and that's why I say I find it bitterly surprising, because when you talk to Conservative members in private, they are as concerned about what's going on in their own communities as Labour members are as well. And when you look at actually what's happening across local government, it's not just us on this side of the House that are raising these concerns, you know, because we... I will give way to the honourable lady. Way. I was a, a, a councillor for 10 years in a local authority in the north of England, and I totally agree. I think it is time that everybody speaks up against these cruel cuts that completely demolish local authorities. And I, I do get it that people say, oh, yeah, the Lib Dems were also involved in this um, at the beginning of the coalition years. And I think we need to take responsibility and say, yes, um, there was a point um, where we agreed to that, but enough is enough. We have to stand up. This is no longer acceptable. Our local services are no longer any services to speak of, and our, our, everybody suffers from it. Andrew Gwynn. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady, and I'll be kind to her because she was the uh, German teacher for my uh, son <laughs> at Aldenshaw School. Um, and she, I think, is right to acknowledge the role that the Liberal Democrats played in this. I know she wasn't a member of this House at the time that the cuts were made, but some of the most damaging and deepest cuts that were made to local government happened under the Coalition Government. And there wasn't a single Liberal Democrat member of Parliament that stood up, spoke out and voted against those cuts. So I'm afraid the Liberal Democrats do have a role to play uh, and, uh, and a responsibility uh, for the state that local government is in today. But she's absolutely right in the other respect that enough is enough. Because we know that local government is in crisis. It isn't the Labour Party that's saying it. It's the National Audit Office. It's the Tory controlled local government association. I'll give way to my friend. You're an honest player. Honourable Member for giving way. In my constituency of Peterborough, it is run by a Conservative Council, and they have come to me and said, will you join with us and lobby government and say enough is enough? Stand up for Peterborough. We do not have enough funds. We cannot continue to do more with less. So would he agree with me that actually government needs to listen to their own voices from within and stop this? I absolutely do agree. Uh, with my honourable friend because, you know, it is the Tory-controlled local government association, it's the Tory-controlled county councils network, mm -hmm. they are all speaking with one voice in the local That's government right. family and that is that local government is on its knees, yes. our public yes. services are struggling and that local government cannot carry on uh, if these cuts are to continue uh, over the coming years. And we know what's happening because it's happening today. 
Surrey County Council, one of the richest parts of the country, Tory controlled incidentally, are complaining that they don't have enough money. Well, if Surrey County Council haven't got enough money, what hope have the Liverpools, have the Tamesides, have the Hulls of this world? I will give way. I'm delighted he's made that point because I think what we're with the arguments we're trying to make here is to say this is not economic, this is political. And when Liverpool has 60% of its properties in band A, what hope have we got of raising council tax to pay for all our services? Well, my honourable friend makes a very important point, and of course one of the two local authorities that I represent, the Tameside Metropolitan Borough Council in Greater Manchester, this year has a £16 million social care funding gap. 1% increase on the council tax brings in around about £700,000. Never will the tame sides of this world ever be able to fill the gap of the cuts from central government. So the point my honourable friend makes is absolutely crucial because the authorities that we represent are grant dependent. They are grant dependent for a reason because no amount of business rate retention and of increases in local uh, taxation through the council tax within the referendum uh, framework will ever make up the difference between the cuts that have been made centrally. I will give way to him. Forgiving way, and he's making a very a uh, powerful point. It's very similar in my own local authority of Nottingham City, where the uh, amount required for adult social care extra in the year ahead is £12 million, and the social care precept raises around three. Does he think that the minister expects us to provide each adult, or elderly or disabled person with just a quarter of the care that they need, or should we just pick a quarter of them and ensure that they have the care? and the other three quarters have to be left without the care that they require. What does he think Minister's advice would be? Well, Andrew I'll let the Minister for speak for herself in relation to that, but of course we know that what happens is local authorities have to provide social care, um, they have to provide those services, and it's not the social care services that necessarily get squeezed, it's all the other services and the services that many of our residents uh, access on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of our constituents don't access adult social care unless they've got an elderly uh, relative that needs it. They don't access children's social care unless they've got a child in the system, but they do uh, expect their parks to be well maintained, they do expect their streets to be uh, adequately surfaced, they do expect street lighting to be fixed, they do expect uh, litter to be picked up, they do expect basic decent services and it's those services that are being cut. I'll give them a Exactly. The cuts to the local library service, for example. The local libraries have had to reduce their opening times at the moment. And yet the move towards universal credit means that everyone's expected to apply for everything online. online. Yeah. And where are you told to go and apply for something online? You're told, know. go to your local library and use the computers there. But there aren't enough computers in the local library, and the local library isn't open as much as it used to be. Another consequence, a lack of joined up thinking, a lack of forward planning, and a lack of consideration and regard for the people in the poorer parts of this country. That's true. And absolutely, these are the pressures that uh, are facing our local communities, because we talk about local services as though uh, they are uh, in isolation from mm. one another, but actually... Uh, our local services are the lifeblood of many of our towns, our villages and our communities. And whether it's library services or whether it's uh, welfare support and welfare advice, whether it's uh, housing, uh, these are crucial elements of what makes our communities tick and what brings our communities together. Now, Mr Evans, I speak... Um, not just as the Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, but as somebody who fundamentally believes in the power of local government to make mm. a difference. Yeah. I spent 12 mainly happy years uh, <laughs> as a local councillor on Tameside Council, <clears throat> and uh, my wife uh, is uh, nearing her 18th year as a Tameside councillor, and uh, I want to add uh, to the thanks that my honourable friend for Weaver Vale uh, made at the start of his contribution because we don't say thank you nearly often enough to those of all political parties and none who serve as our local councillors and as our elected mayors 
or indeed to our council staff and officers yeah. that have to implement the decisions that councillors make. And I want to place on uh, the record my thanks and my appreciation for all those who work in our communities as elected members or as uh, members of staff and officers of local authorities because they are on the front line. They are often uh, not just on the front line of defending our public services, but they are the last line of defence when it comes to making the really tough decisions that this government has forced upon them. Uh, and I want uh, to recognise the real value and pride that many of them uh, approach their position uh, as a councillor. Um, Mr Evans, the National Audits Office uh, assessment of the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, I'm afraid, makes for rather uncomfortable reading. Uh, and fundamental to the argument presented by the NAO is the failure of the Ministry to present a long-term strategy for the sector. And as a result, even the four-year settlement that we were told sought to offer some financial stability merely just kicked the can down the road and authorities are now facing major funding uncertainties beyond 2019-2020. But even within these four years of supposed certainty, local government has had to deal with rapidly shifting priorities from central government and often announced at relatively short notice. Now it's reported by the NAO that the majority of case study authorities with social care responsibilities that they spoke to said that central government funding outside the settlement had changed a number of times, for example with the new homes bonus uh, being uh, repurposed uh, to fund adult social care and we are told that it was and I quote the department's view that these changes reflected considered responses to new pressures and risks now anyone who's been following uh, this issue would know very clearly that these pressures and risks have been growing since the beginning of the decade now like with many members who've spoken today in the decade from 2010 to 2020, my own local authority, Tameside, will have lost close to £200 million of funding. Stockport, well <laughs> over £100 million of funding. Now, as I've said, we can never fill those gaps with council tax alone. And while Stockport has a slightly better uh, and more advantageous council tax base than the Tameside part of my constituency, this year... Stockport will have to find a further £18 million worth of savings, or cuts as I like to call them, leading to the council consulting residents on some drastic changes to the delivery of social care. And Tameside has described demand for their services as at unprecedented levels. Now that's because of the wider impact that austerity has on the public purse. Because if we operate in silos, don't be surprised when cost shunting presents itself as a problem on our town hall doorsteps. Because whether it's the closure of our sure start centres, our early intervention, our family support, whether it's the reduction in domestic violence officers that used to be employed by the police that then results into um, children being presented as safeguarding cases yeah. to the local authority. Mm. It all moves one way, from mm. one part of the public sector to yeah. another part of the yeah. public yeah. sector, yeah. whether it's councils pushing on to the NHS, yeah. police pushi pushing on to councils, yeah. it's a merry-go-round of self-defeating prophecy. Yeah. And what we've got to do is stop that and properly fund our services yeah. going yeah. forward. Yeah. Now, uh, Mr Evans, elsewhere in the report, we were told that the government is working towards implementing the Fair Funding Review. But the implications of that are not yet clear. And I have to be um, honest with the minister. Anything that comes out of a minister's mouth that has the words fair funding and local government uh, settlement sends shivers down my spines because we sure know what that means. It means that the Thamesides, the Stockports, the Liverpools, the Durhams, the Lees, the, the Wiggins, the Hulls, the... Uh, and I could rattle through all your, your councils, we will almost certainly end up with less money because that, as 
soon as night follows day is what happens when this Tory government instigates funding changes to local government. And yet we have real social need. We have the inability to raise our money directly. And what we see is a culmination of the crisis that is now facing local government across England. And I have to say to the Minister, what, can, what certainty can she give to our councils that we will genuinely get a fair funding settlement that reflects the needs of our areas and reflects the inability of our areas to make up the gaps in funding through other sources, because so far that has been so badly lacking. Now, I just want to end, Mr Evans, talking about uh, the crisis today, because it is Tory Northamptonshire that is the first council that has effectively declared bankruptcy. Northamptonshire may be the first it almost certainly will not be the last. The National Audit Office reckons that in the next few years, unless the funding settlement improves considerably, uh, one in ten councils with social care responsibilities will have exhausted all of their reserves and almost certainly will be in a similar predicament to uh, Northamptonshire. But how did Northamptonshire which by any standard is a wealthy part of this country with a good council tax base, end up in the situation whereby it had an overspending this year end of around £21 million and yet had depleted its reserves to around £17 million. I'll tell you how they ended up in that predicament. They took the advice of the former Secretary of State, uh, Sir Eric Pickles, who said... Uh, rather than complaining about cuts, spend your reserves. Well, once you've spent your reserves, you, the money's gone. Once you've sold your assets, your asset base has gone. Once the money's gone, you have to make the cuts and the difficult decisions. I'll give way. Um, just on that point, do you agree with me that this is a clear situation of knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing? It absolutely is, but I have to say, if it was compounded by Tory mismanagement at a local level in Northamptonshire, the root cause of the problem undoubtedly comes from this Tory government, because this Tory government have presided over, as we heard from my honourable friend, the member for Weaver Vale, as we've heard from uh, the National Audit Office, in cuts of almost 50% but, uh, uh, of central government funding to local councils. That is unsustainable. If we want our local councils and our councillors to facilitate local services that are of a quality and of an ability to uh, provide dignity to our elderly, to provide the best start for our young and to provide quality public services for the general population, it has to be funded. I'll give way to my friend again. Just on that point, I think we, we've all talked a lot about percentages and we talk a lot about money, and I just want to tell you something that's a little bit more individual. Since 20, uh, there has been an in, in, incredible increase in the number of looked-after children in my constituency, 140 more looked-after children. We have had one of the highest numbers of looked-after children in the whole country, and this is a consequence of the cuts. This is what happens when the cuts happen, because they, can't, they haven't got the money for the early intervention. They haven't got the money for the other services that used to go and give this extra family support. It doesn't exist anymore, because all there is left is the statutory service. All the things around that, the fact that the sure starts used to be available for wider family participation, the fact that the groups that you could take your child to was open to everybody, now it's only open to a small number of people who have to have a particular identified need to be able to access it. This all contributes to the number of increasing number of looked after children. We can't just sit there and ignore it. This is 140 children's lives that have been changed forever. Mm. My honourable friend's absolutely right, but it's worse than that because if we're going to rebuild these services, we have lost over the last eight years thousands of dedicated council workers and staff. We have lost the corporate knowledge and the corporate history that was embedded in our local authorities. And that is difficult. It's not just a question of money. That is really difficult to rebuild overnight that capacity in our local councils. And uh, I'll just end uh, on this, Mr Evans. The reality of government cuts are laid bare. 
in the National Audit Office report. Planning and development has been cut by 52.8%. If we're going to meet the government's targets for new homes, who's going to be the strategic planners of the future to identify the land? Who are going to be the planning officers that will implement uh, the planning applications? Who are going to be the planning enforcement officers to make sure the homes and the buildings are built in accordance with uh, the plans? Because those cuts are unsustainable. Transport has been cut by 37.1%. These are our bus routes. These are our vital links between communities. These are our roads and our pavements, our cycleways. These Cuts are unsustainable. I'll give away again and then I must... For the, last time I've <laughs> just on that point, you know, the government talks a good talk of social mobility. It says about how important this is to everybody. But at the moment, there are young apprentices living in rural areas of the country that can't afford to go and do an apprenticeship. They can't afford to attend the college or they can't get there because there are no local transport services for them to use. Absolutely. <laughs> Our museums, our heritage, our cultural services, the, th the glue that makes our communities tick, the, who we are, that sense of place. Funding has been cut by 34.9%. And housing services, that's not just about making sure people have roofs over their heads. It's about support to, uh, to the homeless. It's about ensuring uh, that our housing markets work correctly it's about tackling the scourge of rust sleeping these have been cut by 45.6 percent now when a government has created a 5.8 billion pounds gap in the local government funding when everyone is saying that social care is on its knees when children's services needs an additional two billion pounds it's this Secretary of State, it's this Minister, and it's this Tory government who all stick their heads in the sand. They fail to give our services the money that they need, and they fail to ignore the crisis that is happening on their watch to our services, to our communities. We need a government committed to our local councils. We need a government committed to rebuilding our communities. We need a Labour government for the many, not the few. Yeah. 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 Yeah.